this working? Yes? Good? All right, brilliant. Well, welcome back to the second uh, session. Uh, we've got uh, two more papers uh, with a break for tea, as I would put it in uh, my English way, um, at four o'clock. Um, and our first speaker, we're moving on broadly chronologically uh, in keeping with the introduction to the conference to uh, look at those modern philosophers especially those committed to the new sciences. Um, and the first paper is from Daniel Garber from Princeton um, with a slightly revised title, Divine Laws and Divine Decrees and the Order of Nature. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And um, I would also like to thank um, um, Eric for having organized this conference and for having um, um, invited me to speak here. Um, the theme of the conference is historical perspectives on God's order, uh, man's order, and the order of nature. And in my presentation today, I'm not going to spend much time with man's order. Interesting, though, that certainly is. Um, my interest is squarely in the question of the order of nature and the way in which the order of nature does and even more interestingly, doesn't intersect with God's order. What I'd like to show is how closely associated natural order was with the divine order, the way in which certain central figures in 17th century thought um, um, connected the idea of natural order with that of a realm um, ordered and sustained uh, by God. Um, this much, in a way, is the easy part. Um, the hard part is what happens when you get rid of God, or at least what happens when you get rid of a transcendent God. Um, and that's the part that I'd like to explore in more detail. Um, I'll begin with Descartes, who sets the agenda for a kind of physics in the 17th century. Um, though Leibniz criticizes Descartes in many respects on the foundations of that physics, in many respects, he also continues the, tr the tradition of this kind of a theological physics. Um, and this was actually the paper that I thought that I was going to write when I um, began working out my ideas for this conference. Uh, but the paper got sort of hijacked along the way. And um, I began to think that it was much more interesting to explore what happens when you give up the idea of a transcendent God um, as did Hobbes and Spinoza. Uh, what then becomes of the order of nature? Um, these people are writing, Hobbes and Spinoza are writing in an age in which um, the order of nature is very, very much on people's minds. But of course, um, they both of them in different ways uh, want to set aside uh, at very least traditional conceptions of God. Um, and what happens uh, when you try to do a sort of early modern um, um, uh, version of um, this, the, this, these newer ideas um, in the context of their um, view of the world. Um, and I'll warn you that this is very much a preliminary pass through some very complicated uh, material. The story for Descartes and Leibniz is pretty clearly and pretty well worked out. Um, but not so for Hobbes and Spinoza. Um, there's also a good bit of ground to cover here, and I'll be moving um, um, fairly quickly. But what I would like to do is um, set out at least a rough map of the terrain. If you notice, there are a lot of um, uh, quotations, uh, a lot of uh, passages on the handout. I'm not obviously going to read them all. In a certain way, what this paper is is a kind of running commentary on, on these passages, and I'll try to make uh, some sense of them and try to um, construct a story around them. Um, so let's begin with Descartes. Uh, Descartes is often given credit for introducing the idea of a law of nature, or at least the idea of universal general laws of nature into um, uh, physics. Um, while it isn't entirely true, it's not that far from being true. And this connects with um, uh, what it is that Marilyn Adams was talking about um, 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 earlier today. I think that um, in the, you know, to speak 
very broadly and perhaps a little irresponsibly, um, in the um, um, Aristotelian natural philosophy, you don't have general laws of nature, laws that cover nature as a whole. You have laws of natures in the plural, which is to say each nature, earth, air, etc., has its own what you might think of as laws. Um, in Descartes, you actually have um, um, uh, a world governed by what, might, what he explicitly calls laws of nature, leges naturae. Um, in part, he can have these because you now have the idea that body as a whole has a single nature. There aren't going to be different kinds of bodies with distinct natures. There is one kind of body, and it has a distinctive kind of nature. And so one can talk about its laws as, in a way, the universal laws of material um, nature. Um, now, this was quite a new conception when Descartes introduces it in the 1630s and 40s. Um, it can't be found in other reformers of the period, such as Bacon or Galileo. Surprisingly, Galileo does not use the concept of a law. Uh, the idea of a law of nature, I think, also remains distinctively Cartesian through much of the um, 17th century, at least. Um, now, in the Principles of Philosophy, uh, Descartes posits three laws and a conservation uh, principle. He does it a little bit differently in the earlier uh, Le Monde, uh, but we're going to stick to the later and somewhat improved presentation. And the laws of nature are as follows, and these are on your sheet. Law one, each and everything, insofar as it can, always continues in the same state, and thus what is once in motion always continues to move. Law two, all motion is in itself rectilinear, and hence, anybody moving in a circle always tends to move away from the center of the circle, which it describes. Those two laws together look very much like Newton's principle of inertia. Interesting question, of course, uh, what is the relation? Why does Descartes divide them into two? Um, and there's an interesting answer to that, but I'm not going to uh, talk about that today. And law three um, is a collision rule. If a body collides with another body that's stronger than itself, it loses none of its motion. But if it collides with a weaker body, it loses a quantity of motion equal to that which it imparts to the other body. And these are quotations um, um, uh, from the principles. Uh, behind these laws, and in fact used in crucial ways um, to apply particularly the third law to the real world, is a claim that that the total quantity of motion is measured by size times speed remains constant in the world. Now, interestingly enough, this isn't called a law, uh, a principle, or anything else. Um, but it's very clearly asserted and seems to be the rock on which the rest of Descartes' thought about the order of the world is grounded. Um, the, this claim, and in fact all the other laws, are grounded explicitly in the activity of a transcendent god on his creation. Like virtually all Christian thinkers from the medieval, such as St. Thomas, on down to Descartes' day, and this is Catholic as well as Protestant, um, Descartes held a version of the doctrine of continual recreation. Um, as he put it in the uh, Principia, you can also find this, of course, in, uh, or a version of this in Meditation 3. For the nature of time is such that its parts are not mutually dependent and never coexist. Thus, from the fact that we now exist, it does not follow. We shall exist a moment from now unless there is some cause, some cause which originally produced us, which continually reproduces us, and as it were, that is to say, which keeps us in existence. Now, the doctrine leads him directly to the conservation of the quantity of motion in the world. And I won't read that whole passage, but just point out a couple of um, 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 the sentences. In the beginning, God created matter along with its motion and rest, and now, merely by his regular concurrence, he preserves the same amount of motion and rest in the material universe as he put there in the beginning. For we understand that God's perfection involves not only his being immutable in itself, but also his operating 
in a manner that is always utterly constant and immutable. Um, and so he says, thus God imparted various motions to the parts of matter. When he first created them, and he now preserves all this matter in the same way, by the same process by which he originally created it. Of course, a reference back to the continual um, recreation doctrine. Um, and it follows from what we have said that th this fact alone makes it most reasonable to think that God likewise always preserves the same quantity of motion in matter. Okay, so the, the conservation principle is grounded in this idea that God preserves the same, um, I'm sorry, that God preserves the world from moment to moment. And in preserving the world, he preserves the motion he put in it, and in preserving the motion he puts in it, there will be this physical magnitude that he calls quantity of motion that remains constant. Um, but the other laws that God presents are also grounded in God's sustenance of the world. Um, after the second law, he notes, the reason for this second law, um, for, or for the second rule, is the same as the reason for the first rule, namely the immutability and simplicity of the operation by which God preserves motion in matter. For he always preserves the motion in the precise form in which it's occurring at the very moment when he preserves it without taking into account, uh, taking any account of the motion which was occurring a little while earlier. And similarly for the third law, um, and I won't read that, that's the next um, passage at the, at the very bottom of the first page of the handout, since God preserves the world, et cetera, et cetera. So the conservation principle and all three laws of um, uh, nature are um, thus grounded in divine immutability and the fact that the created world depends from moment to moment on the power um, uh, by which God keeps the world in existence. Um, now, it's important to recognize here um, that these are not laws that God chooses and then imposes on the world. Descartes doesn't think that we can establish anything about the world through arguing from God's intentions, from final causes. So the idea isn't that God chooses these things and imposes them on the world. We can't reason that way in physics. And the, the next um, 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 quotation on the handout is from Principles uh, Part 1, where he denies that final causes are of use in physics. When, with dealing with natural things, we will then never derive any explanations from the purposes which God or nature may have had in view in creating them. Um, for we shall not be so arrogant as to suppose that we can share in God's plans. We should instead consider him as the efficient cause of all things, and starting from the divine attributes which by God's will we have some knowledge of, we shall see, with the aid of our God-given natural light, what conclusions can be drawn concerning those effects which are apparent to our senses. And this describes exactly what it is that's going on in Descartes' derivation of, these, um, of the conservation principle and the laws of uh, nature. God reveals, us an at reveals to us an attribute, his immutability, from which we can infer from the natural light that bodies must satisfy certain laws. These are not laws imposed uh, from without by a benevolent God who chooses them for a reason. They're simply the result of how an immutable God sustains the world from moment to moment. Uh, now, God, one might imagine, doesn't even think of them as laws. Perhaps they are just the way in which we conceptualize the moment-by-moment -moment activity of an immutable God sustaining his creation. But for others, though, um, they thought of the activity of God in ordering the material world in different terms. Um, and a key figure here is Leibniz. Um, though he differed from Descartes in the laws that